Can you combine the functions of every infantry small arm into a single rifle design? In the late 1940s and 50s, the United States certainly thought they could, and produced the M14 Battle Rifle, a rifle with a reputation so varied that there are as many opinions on it as there were M14s produced. Nevertheless, the M14 was intended to be the ultimate improvement on the so-called greatest battle implement ever devised, but had one of the shortest lives as the standard issue weapon of the US military, and would never see the war that it was designed to fight. Caught in the epicenter of a revolution in firearms design, the M14, as with the FAL, is a fascinating example of the future some countries envisioned for the wars they would fight in the coming decades after World War II, and serves as a transitional design between the wooden bolt-action rifles of yesteryear and the select-fire rifles that rose to the forefront during the Cold War. Weighing in at 9.2 pounds and measuring 44.3 inches long, slightly lighter yet longer than its predecessor, the M14 fires the first NATO standard cartridge, the 762 by 51 mm NATO round. Feeding from 10 to 20 round box magazines, the M14 is capable of firing at rates of 700 to 750 rounds per minute with rounds travelling at 853 meters per second, and effective at up to around 800 meters. The M14 story begins while the dust was still settling from the European theatre of the Second World War. Throughout World War II, the United States had employed a plethora of small arms for their infantrymen. The M1911, the M1 Carbine, the M1 Garand, the M1 Thompson, the M3 Grease Gun, the Bar, and the M1919 Browning machine gun, and had become aware of the logistical problem this was creating and sought to remedy it. Over encumbered by the amount of weapons, parts, and ammunition they had to produce, purchase, distribute, and maintain, the US military decided to design a single weapon with the combined capabilities of every small arm the US infantry was using. The M1 Garand was arguably the best weapon fielded by the United States during World War II, and the rifle was seen as the weapon to incorporate the capabilities of other infantry weapons into. But despite an immense reputation, and unofficial title of the greatest battle implement ever devised, the Garand was by no means perfect. The first and most immediate concern to the US military was the on-block clip design, primarily for its severely limited capacity, but also for the distinct ping the weapon made when the clip was spent, and the particularly difficult process of reloading the clips into the weapon. The weapon was also semi-automatic only, and while it had an edge over the mainly bolt-action rifle-equipped regular German and Japanese infantry, it paled in comparison to the automatic infantry weapons some German units were fielding, such as the MP40, STG44, or FG42. The US military had made a request in 1944 to Springfield Armory, the manufacturer John Garand had created the M1 at, for improvements to the weapon, asking for a selective fire operation, 20 round detachable box magazine, ability to launch rifle grenades, mounts for a bipod, and all of this was to weigh 9 pounds at most. Springfield would produce the T20 in 1945, though it weighed 3 pounds more than the military's requirements would allow, and only 100 were ever produced. Thus, Springfield went back to the drawing board. Around this time, the newly formed North Atlantic Treaty Organization was seeking to standardize their weapons and ammunition, and NATO member nations began developing both new weapons and ammunition types to compete for standard adoption. The Belgians and the British would design their new weapons, the original FAL and the EM2 respectively, around the 7x43mm cartridge, while the Americans would utilize the newly developed T65 cartridge in their designs. Created initially as the 7.62x49mm cartridge for another Springfield Armory rifle design known as the T25, the round would evolve to be 7.62x51mm, having similar performance as the previously favored 30 6 cartridge due to its new ball powder. Eventually, the T65 round would be standardized as the 7.62x51mm NATO round after Winston Churchill's 1951 election, siding with the Americans on the issue, 
and soon the American military would begin testing weapons chambered in the new cartridge to adopt as their new standard issue. Competing were the T-47, a modified version of the aforementioned T-25, the T-48, a modified version of the FNFAL, and the T-44, a modified version of the T-20. The T-44 would ultimately win out, the T-47 being significantly less reliable than the other two offerings, and while the T-48 was virtually equal in every aspect, with FN even offering to waive licensing fees for production in America, the US chose the homegrown T-44 design, adopting it in 1957 as the M14. The decision to standardize the T-44 was also due to an erroneous myth that the weapon was capable of being produced on the existing machinery for the M1 Garand, a myth that would prove to cause production issues for the M14 when it was eventually adopted. Production began in 1959, and despite some initial problems, by 1964 nearly 1.5 million M14s had been produced, all at 70% the cost per weapon than the M1 Garand, and it saw heavy use in the initial American combat involvement in Vietnam. The M14's use in Vietnam is where the weapon's flaws began to show. The weapon, due to its calibre size, was uncontrollable in automatic fire, and was considered too heavy by many that used it. Designed to replace not just the M1 Garand, but the M1 Carbine, M1918 Bar, and M3 Grease Gun, it proved successful in replacing none of them as the Vietnam War progressed. As a battle rifle, it can be argued that it performed quite well, but as for the other weapons it was meant to replace, well it was too much firepower to be as effective at close ranges like the grease gun was, but it had too little firepower to be as effective as a squad automatic weapon as the bar was. With the realization that the warfare of the day demanded a lighter rifle with intermediate ammunition and capable of handling close to mid-range engagements, in addition to the realization that the US had essentially designed a weapon for the now outdated battlefield of the 1940s, the US would replace the M14 in 1968 with the equally, if not more problematic, M16. Despite not lasting very long as the standard issue weapon, the M14 has had a long legacy of variants. The M15 was an experimental squad automatic weapon variant, with a heavier barrel and stock, hinged buttplate, a bipod, and the sling from the bar. But this variant was dropped after a standard M14 equipped with a bipod and the hinged buttplate were found to perform just as well. That variant was known as the M14E2 and was first developed in 1963, but would become adopted as the M14A1 in 1966, having a full pistol gripped inline stock to control recoil, a plastic upper forend to save weight, a muzzle compensator, the bar's sling, an M2 bipod, a folding metal vertical foregrip mounted under the forend of the stock, and a rubber recoil shoulder pad under the hinged butt plate. The M14 would be adopted in a DMR role in the US Navy as the M14 DMR, adding a fiberglass stock and an improved barrel. The M14 would also be the basis of the M14 DMR's replacement, the M39 Enhanced Marksman Rifle, along with the Mark 14 Enhanced Battle Rifle. The M14 would get a bullpup configuration in the late 1980s known as the M89SR, or Model 89 Sniper Rifle, and was built for the Israeli Defense Forces. It would get another bullpup variant in the late 90s, known as the AWC G2A Sniper Rifle, and was tested by the Fort Bragg Sniper School around this time, but was ultimately dropped. There also exist two US military sniper variants of the M14, known as the M21 and M25, both being more accurized versions of the weapon and equipped with telescopic sights. For civilians, there are a number of semi-automatic only M14s available for purchase from various manufacturers as well as an official version from Springfield themselves, known as the M1A, which has its own options in terms of stocks, barrels, etc. 
In the over 50 years since the M14 was replaced by the arguably inferior, but certainly just as notorious M16, the weapon has remained in service with the US military, even if not in its original form. The M39 EMR and Mark 14 EBR both are still actively used by the US Armed Forces, along with the two sniper variants, the M21 and M25, also remaining in service in some capacity. Wooden framed M14s are also a common sight in military ceremonies, maintaining at least a symbolic service even if it has been outpaced by the modern battlefield. The large conventional conflict the US predicted and designed the M14 to fight in would not come to pass, and the US found themselves fighting guerrilla forces more and more, often in unconventional battles as the Cold War progressed and into the 21st century. The M14, despite being created to handle any problem infantrymen could find themselves facing, ultimately could handle little on the real battlefields of the 1960s, and has ended up in a similar spot to the FNFAL, both being popular to this day and having a legendary status, but both being largely outdated within mere years of their introduction. The M14 was another transitional design, representative of the shift from wooden weapons and individual marksmanship to metallic and polymer weapons with volume of fire carrying more significance in a battle's outcome. Regardless, some still swear by the M14, attributing its short service life to the political maneuverings of then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and holding it as one of the greatest rifles ever devised. However you view the M14, it is the final weapon that can be attributed to John Garand, and it will always be one of the US's most recognizable firearms in its arsenal. The last true American battle rifle, the M14 represents an end to wooden framed weapons and pre-Cold War military strategy, and its quick demise a reminder of just how much warfare, if only on the battlefield itself, can change so dramatically in just a few short years. Thank you so very much for watching these videos. Please like and subscribe and comment below what you'd like to see me cover next. 